America's current strategy for fighting inflation is cranking up rates in what I'll call a conflict of interest. Now this strategy is catching a lot of flack right now because it boils down to let's intentionally contract the economy to drive down employment and demand and subsequently drive down prices. When damage is the goal, what could go wrong? Now more specifically with this strategy, we're looking at more people getting fired, meaning remaining workers will have less bargaining power, pay those guys less money, and that's going to cut down on costs for producers and hopefully those savings are going to get passed on to consumers in the form of lower prices. And get this, at the same time we're doing all that, we're killing two birds with one stone because people are getting paid less so they're going to demand less stuff. Producers going to have to lower your prices to keep getting sales. We're fighting inflation here. Now critics are arguing that this is like killing a spider by burning down your house. Several House Democrats have come out saying that an inflation reduced paycheck is much better than no paycheck at all. Now this all of course begs the obvious follow up question, what's the alternative here? Now the main alternative is some form of price controls. You want to keep prices down? Let's not beat around the bush here, strike at the source, prices. Now when I was first starting to catch some whiffs of this price control solution, my mind immediately went to the constitution. Surely, and I'm not sure where, but surely we can't do that, right? Well, it turns out that we've actually used that system to fight inflation before, more specifically during and after World War II. At that time, America's at war, we're spending a whole bunch of money hiring a limited workforce to build stuff for the front lines, bunch of money going to a limited worker pool, recipe for inflation. Now we started seeing the workforce demand more and more goods because what do you know, they had more and more money. So you as the government, what are you going to do? A whole bunch of new controls. Alright first, we're going to make it so producers can't raise their prices. A dollar today is going to go just as far right now as it will be able to years from now. Government mandate. And second, because the amount of money you have is going to keep going up and up, but prices are going to remain the same, we're also going to have to limit the amount of stuff you can buy. If you double the amount of money that everyone in an economy has, but keep prices the exact same, well people are going to buy more and more things leading to shortages. So okay. America is paying workers a bunch of money to build goods, but capping prices and purchasing. This whole system led to a few really interesting side effects. Now first, a black market popped up for consumer goods. You buy your government allocation at the set price. Want more though? Well, I know a guy who can get you a pound of chicken on the black market, but it's going to cost you. Now second, unable to raise prices, producers started to cut costs in other places. A ton of layoffs on the back end. If you're not making the product, we can sell it without you. We're worried about shortages here. We don't need marketing. Similarly, maybe stick some extra cardboard in the meat to keep the production costs down. We can't raise prices, but we can certainly cut costs. Still, overall, if the goal is keeping prices down and goods accessible for everyone in the economy, it worked really, really well. Now then another strange problem arose. Now because the government was limiting both prices and how much you could buy, people started to accumulate more and more money. Now that might sound like a great thing, and depending on who you ask, it was, but what it meant in practice for this policy was. The moment America reverted prices back to the free market again, prices would shoot up. Now this was evident when, after removing price caps for meat in 1946, meat prices doubled overnight. Now most people were ready, willing, and able to buy goods at these higher prices, so producers raised them when given the opportunity to. Now then, after that meat thing happened, the government quickly sent a reply all email, disregard the previous policy, we're getting these regulations back in place. 
Now, unfortunately, the longer that these policies were in place, the larger the dam we had to keep building. As more wealth was accumulating, that we needed to prevent from being spent, either triggering shortages, people over shopping, or triggering inflation, producers raising prices to the point where demand was realigned with supply again. Now, at the end of the day, people took to the streets to protest the government limiting the amount of goods that individuals can buy. I can afford to buy so much more meat, so why can't I? Of course, the response was, well, if we let prices float on the free market, then this would probably be the amount of meat you could afford. The only reason everyone can afford so much meat is because we're mandating these lower prices. We just have to keep people from buying all the meat that they can afford and that they want because well, that amount is more than all the meat that's currently in the system. Everyone buying what they wanted would have led to shortages and empty shelves. Now, later in 1946, the meat industry actually straight up stopped producing new meat because with prices capped, it was at an unprofitable venture. So, at that point, the price controls were reversed and free markets were returned. Inflation that next year went up 20% as people burned through their savings continuing to buy things and in response, producers raised their prices to match this new demand. Now then, after that painful inflationary year, things just sort of balanced out and went back to normal up until the 1970s and Volcker shock. See previous episode, link at the end. Now, depending on who you ask with this entire thing, this strategy was maybe preferable to the alternative, which would be raise interest rates, which would cut demand and employment so wages, production, and subsequently prices would all go down. Keep the market in the middle of the focus, though. So these two large problems with the price fixing solution were, a, it takes a free market out of the equation, so the government has to step in and start limiting all sorts of stuff, how much you can buy, what price you can buy it at, and B, it's really hard to quit once you start, because there's going to be a massive price spike as you transition out of government controlled pricing. Also, separate note, producers might stop making a product or substantially cut quality if the profit incentives are sufficiently negated. Still though. Prices stay affordable for everyone participating in the economy and there isn't the same hit to unemployment as there would be with higher interest rates. Now in this modern conversation, nobody is proposing price fixing as a solution to the inflation problem. Well, maybe a random guy on Twitter who's shadow boxing, but we're seeing something a bit more sophisticated as an alternative, margin capping. Now you can make this much off of sales, government dictates. It's a less extreme version, and an even less extreme version of that is a windfall tax. If you start making a whole bunch more money selling the same amount of a product, well, there's a tax for that. So for this next part, I'd like you to pay attention to my sources, because the names you're about to see aren't from Socialists R Us. Instead, I'm going to be citing Bloomberg, who, well, it's hard to make the argument that they aren't pro-business at the end of the day. So these windfall tax or margin capping policies are so appealing right now because throughout this whole thing, corporations are making more money since, well, since the government lifted their price restrictions in the late 1940s. Turns out, corporations might be inflating inflation for additional profits. They're certainly not letting a good crisis go to waste. <clears throat> Costs are going up. We're going to need to raise prices by a dollar to make as much as we were before. Well, while we're already raising prices, why not bump that up to a buck fifty and give us both a sweet bonus on top of everything else? Oh man, this inflation is awful, guys. We had to raise prices by a buck fifty to keep above water on this new yacht. Now the argument here is that we should focus on corporations bumping up prices a bit more than necessary and scraping that extra bit off the top. Now that might not sound like price fixing to most people, but in my mind this all goes back to two different views of the economy. A conservative would point out that if despite raising your prices more than necessary, you're still selling through all your inventory, 
well, then there isn't actually a mismatch of supply and demand here. People are still buying your stuff at gouged prices. I mean, sure, they're complaining about it a lot, but if the payment goes through, then that certainly speaks louder than tweets. Lowering margins, in their mind, would mean one of two things. Either first, the producers are going to need to raise their costs even more to fully justify those price hikes, or second, producers are going to have to reduce their prices. Now, of course, if it comes to reducing prices, well then, the conservatives would be worried that we'd be going back to empty shelves, as lower pricing would generate more demand than there is supply, or straight up good old fashioned government rationing that was annoying so many people in the 1940s. Lower prices, people can afford more, so people buy more. Plus, they would be concerned that once we start regulating profit margins, ending the regulations and returning to normal would be potentially political suicide, resulting in large readjustment prices. Now, of course, that last negative could also be a positive depending on who you're talking to. <gasps> what? It's going to be harder and harder to stop regulating corporate margins? Oh my. Progressives would start countering that by saying, all right, regulating margins isn't going to be putting anyone out of business. It's just ensuring that we don't see price hikes that are currently wreaking havoc on the entire economy and more specifically falling on the poorest of Americans. Hey corporations, glad you used an equation to find the exact breaking point of America's most vulnerable and price your products accordingly. Good business move. Now, unfortunately, the government isn't in the business of handing out good, optimally exploitative business practice awards, and instead, we're a bit more focused on the guys at the bottom rungs of the economy. Now, we as the government are seeing across the board right now complaints about prices being too high. And, well, these things are things that we can substantively do to have an effect on prices and bring them back into market, whilst also having a minimal impact on businesses and the economy. You're still making money. In fact, you're still making as much money as before. You're just not making more money. Now, at the end of the day, I'm representing two different approaches to dealing with inflation. On one side, you got the conservative approach that embraces supply and demand. We have to shrink the economy, reduce demand, and that reduced demand is going to result in lower prices. Thank you about the liberal approach that leaves the supply and demand framework entirely by artificially lowering prices and then putting in government regulations to make sure that skyrocketing, skyrocketing demand doesn't lead to shortages and empty shelves. Now, of course, that's not to mention some other future episode proposals from progressives. For example, things like flipping the supply and demand structure on its head by actually increasing supply. Alright, we're making more things now. You gotta lower your prices a bit to sell them all. Now, this strategy was highlighted in the Inflation Reduction Act, which encouraged new manufacturing through government subsidies. They build more additional things and will pay you and also the releasing of oil from a strategic petroleum reserves. More oil, lower prices, gotta sell it all. Now, other strategies included reducing costs through subsidies for existing producers. Hey, you're still making this stuff? I'll pay a little to reduce the price and pushing cheaper oil, which is a major cost for most producers. Cheaper oil, eh, maybe you could slide a little bit off the top for everybody. Unfortunately, a cost-cutting strategy on its own has the potential to backfire if not accompanied by some sort of margin regulation. You see, companies have recently been accused of seeing the government paying for a percentage of a product and then raising their prices to the point where you, the end consumer, were paying the same amount as before, but now the government, on top of that amount you're paying, is giving them a sweet little tip. Now, one final thing to consider in this conversation when you're thinking about some alternative proposals to fighting inflation is politics. You see, the Federal Reserve is America's pistol with one shot. In the absence of a better solution, well, we're going to be shrinking that economy to combat inflation. The Federal Reserve, well, they're an independent body established and granted these specific powers by Congress about a century ago. And you know what? 
they're going to do what they're going to do based on the actions they see everyone else taking in the government and the private markets. Now on the other hand, to get alternative proposals like these progressive policies for fighting inflation into place, you're going to need a you're going to need Congress to act and you know, good luck there. Now this is why, despite the fact that you got these ideas being talked about in the periphery, most people are treating the Federal Reserve like they're really the only ones who could do anything when it comes to fighting inflation. So overall with this episode, I hope I helped you guys understand this inflation fighting debate a little bit more. For regular viewers, sorry it took me so long to finish this episode. I proposed making it over a month ago. Things have been a bit time consuming at my day job recently. Until next time, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. If you want to check out that video I mentioned earlier about Volker, people seem to be liking it, like to dislike ratio, pretty good on it, links right over here. Also remember to subscribe, ring that bell so that fan will continue to ring, and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.